as things stand today in 2023, do you believe that there is an optimum diet for humans to follow? And if so, what would that diet be? Yeah, I think I just put my next book to bed actually this week, uh, turned in the manuscript. And I've, I've been, I've been teaching pe people how to eat for, for 25 years now. And with each, I guess, passing year and with better and better testing, uh, I think that there are, um, certain things that people need to eat and certain things that people probably ought to avoid, but there's provisos. And I spent a lot of time looking at super old people in my practice. I've been blessed to learn from a lot of them. And I have spent actually a lot of research years looking at super old people around the world and trying to figure out what makes them tick. And so for instance, my my big blockbuster book was The Plant Paradox, which came out about six years ago. And since that time, um, I've learned a whole lot more than I knew back then. So uh, every time I learn something new, I'm one of those idiots who say, hey, you know, I probably wasn't right about this and I've changed my mind. And, and here's why I've changed my mind. And so... If people will uh, allow me, uh, I'll change my mind about things. Now, I appreciate that. And I definitely want to talk about some of the things that you have changed your mind on or certainly evolved your view on. In terms of general principles, though, for people to follow, because here's the reality that I see, and I'm sure you're aware of as well, is that people are very confused these days about nutrition. And I've often thought that actually one of the problems is these days that we have nutrition experts because what it used to be is that we would learn how to eat from our culture, from our parents, from our grandparents. We didn't need nutrition experts to teach us what we should be consuming. But somewhere along the line with modern living, with us moving, with the way we're now living, with the way jobs change, with the way pollution has changed, the way farming has changed. We've got to a situation where many of us feel sick a lot of the time, and we're looking for helpful information to get us feeling better. Now, the problem is, is that people hear different nutrition experts who they respect say some quite different things. And I, I really want this conversation to be practical and helpful for people. You have got a huge amount of experience. You've written many different books. So I guess what I'm trying to get to at the start is, are there some core principles that you think we can all agree on and are worth people trying to implement into their lives? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll give you a, a famous saying from uh, what we in the United States feel is the godfather of fitness. And his name was Jack LaLanne. And um, Jack Elaine um, died in his in his late nineties. He actually died of pneumonia. He wouldn't take antibiotics, but that's an aside. And, and I knew Jack Elaine in his later years. And Jack Elaine used to have an expression that if it tastes good, spit it out. Now, a lot of my advisors say, "Would you stop saying that because your you're scaring people that you want them to eat bark and twigs and bitter tasting stuff. And nobody will do that. And I said, well, no, that's actually not what Jack meant. Uh, and what he meant, and I think <clears throat> he was absolutely right, is that we actually should be eating for the hundred trillion living beings in our gut and in our mouth. Um, the microbiome, uh, instead of eating for this two by three inch piece of muscle in our mouth called the tongue. And if we, if we eat for them and give them what they need, uh, we're their home and they in turn will take care of us. And this is, this is, you know, Hippocrates 2,500 years ago said all disease begins in the gut. And 
I spent the last 25 years trying to figure out how he knew that because uh, he was right. And another way of explaining that is death begins in the gut. And my research, lots of other people's research have, have led me to conclude that that's exactly right. And um, uh, if we eat not for ourselves, uh, but for what our microbiome needs, the rest is a piece of cake. They'll, they'll take a care of everything else. It's really interesting in your latest book, not the one you just turned in, but your, your latest book, Unlocking the Keto Codes. A lot of the principles you outline in that book really are about supporting our gut microbiome, aren't they? And I right. found the concept in that book really, really interesting, you know, tying this into the theme of what you are changing your mind on, what you are evolving your view on. It's really interesting in that book how you spoke about certain things you got wrong with the ketogenic diet. So I wonder if we could go into that. What did you previously think? And then when you did the research, what did you evolve your thinking to be? Well, so I've, I've had a, a ketogenic version of, of my diet, really in all my books. And one of the things that kind of surprises people when they look at, quote, my ketogenic diet is there's a, a lot of um, bitter greens. There's actually a lot of carbohydrates in it. And there's a lot of polyphenol containing foods. And I didn't really have uh, a whole lot of, of fat in the diet. Now, I had specific fats in the diet that we can get into. And a lot of those specific fats in the diet were looking at uh, the blue zones and what the blue zones ate and what made them blue zones. And I, I see people six days a week in my office. You know, and I do blood work on my patients every three months. And the reason I started doing that is, well, I'd take certain foods away from people or give them certain foods, or I'd ask them to get a supplement at a health food store, or they'd take it away. And we could see patterns. Uh, and these patterns were actually pretty obvious. So in answer to your question, I would have a number of people do a traditional high fat, low carbohydrate, ketogenic diet. Um, and when they were doing that, yes, they would lose weight. And a lot of them felt a whole lot better. But when I actually looked at their blood work, uh, inflammatory markers, simple ones like HSCRP or fibrinogen or myeloperoxidase and more complex ones like tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-16 and IL-6. These people who were losing weight on this high fat diet actually had inflammatory markers that looked quite impressive. And Yes, a lot of them, their LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, would go up. And I, quite frankly, could care less about LDL. We can get into that if you want. But uh, they would oxidize their LDL. Uh, it would become rancid uh, or rusty. And I, I come from the school that cholesterol isn't bad for you unless it's oxidized. So, so we'd see all these parameters that they'd be losing weight and they'd actually be feeling pretty good, but we'd see all these inflammatory markers climb. And so when I asked them to stop doing that and they'd see it, you know, on the reports, they go, whoa, then those inflammatory markers subsided. And so those are the sort of things that informed me that perhaps the traditional ketogenic diet is not a great idea. Yeah, let's just um, pause here for a second, because I think there's a lot of terms now that are used in nutrition, like the ketogenic diet. And I think we could take 10 people doing a ketogenic diet, and they may well be eating in very different ways. And I, I really feel when it comes to nutrition, we've we've got to be careful how we talk about these things, right? So 
Well, something I've started saying on this podcast quite a lot is that nutrition these days tends to be quite a divisive topic. And <laughs> I always, I mean, that's the understatement of the year. But I always say in the intros to my podcast that, look, guys, when you're listening to nutrition information, what information you need is going to depend on your current state of health, your goals, and your previous relationship with food. For example, if you are overweight and you have type 2 diabetes, the nutrition advice you need may be a little bit different from someone, let's say, who is underweight and who has been struggling with, let's say, an eating disorder, right? So I'm always quite conscious of that now when I put out information to say, look, who is this for? So if we go back to a ketogenic diet, for, for, for instance, as you've just mentioned, it's pretty well established, I think, that if you are overweight, if you have type 2 diabetes, that for some people, a form of low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet can be useful to help someone lose weight and stabilize their blood sugar, right? So that's the context. And you're saying that the way some people do that is ending up causing other problems. So in the short term, they feel good. And some of them, maybe not all of them, but some of them, and I've heard you say this previously, have got increased markers of inflammation, increased oxidized cholesterol, and increased blood vessel stiffness. I've heard you talk about these things really, really interesting. So by seeing that, what conclusions did you draw? What changes would you then ask those patients to make? And did you see those markers start to change? Yeah. So and again, I think this gets back to Jack Lane and Hippocrates, and I don't, I don't put them as equals, but anyhow, um, what happens at least in in this group of people is um, the gut microbiome uh, has evolved with us uh, over over millions of years, and the gut microbiome for lack of a better word, uh, enjoys uh, starches, um, polysaccharides that uh, normally if we were eating a whole food diet, uh, a lot of the uh, undigestible starches that uh, we can't digest would, would get to our colon where the vast majority of our microbiome sits and they love to uh, ferment these undigestible sugars. And in that fermentation process, if we're lucky and we have the right diversity of microbiome, then they make uh, some phenomenal compounds which are classified as short-chain fatty acids, uh, the most important of which is butyrate. And butyrate uh, is probably the most signaling molecule, most important signaling molecule that we have available to us to, to make our brain work, to make our mitochondria work, to make us lose weight. You name it, make us feel better. You name it, uh, butyrate is the key. Uh, when we do a very low carbohydrate diet or even a FODMAP diet, where we remove all these fermentable sugars from our diet, um, we stop the process of making the short-chain fatty acids. And those short-chain fatty acids are, you know, they educate our immune system, they keep the wall of our gut intact, uh, they keep everything running. And that's what, and they, they make our blood vessels flexible. You know, these are all generally classified as postbiotics. And so we'd see this on our patients. And then when we, we gave them back uh, not only fermentable fibers, uh, but also what I think is amazing to me and I write about in, in the Unlocking the Keto Code, is you can't just give people fermentable fibers. Uh, beautiful work out of Stanford by the Sonnenberg you know, husband and wife team uh, has shown that you can take two groups of human beings, give one group a lot of fiber, and the other group 
same amount of fiber, but give them fermented foods. In, in, in this case, it was mostly yogurts, but uh, ferment vinegars or fermented foods. Uh, kimchi is fermented food. And look at what happens to their microbiome diversity and also their inflammatory markers. And what I think was shocking about this study it was that the people who got all the fiber didn't change their gut microbiome diversity. They didn't get more uh, uh, diverse. And their inflammatory markers didn't improve. But the addition of fermented foods to that fiber improved the microbiome diversity and made the inflammation go away. And you go, what? How's that happen? Well, the long and short of it is all of us, all of our various cultures, wherever we originated uh, in the world, uh, all had a process of fermentation of various substances that we eat. And I mean, it's phenomenal when we look back at what cultures do, that cultures from recorded time uh, detoxified plants with fermentation, preserved foods with fermentation. And I think this this paper out of Stanford uh, maybe starts to unlock, okay, what what is it that all these cultures knew that, you know, saved their lives, improved their lives? And that's kind of what I'm interested in. Yeah, it's really interesting and, and goes back to what I was saying right at the start of this conversation, that we used to learn what to eat from our family, from our culture, and certainly not for everyone, but for a lot of us, that was all we needed to do when it came to nutrition, certainly in maybe a different era, maybe before this modern, hyper-industrialized uh, world in which we live. So I guess it's going back as to what can we learn? What have we forgotten? What do we need to relearn? What you said there about fermented foods is really, really interesting because so far, Dr. Gundry, what we've spoken about, what you've spoken about is that we need to eat in ways that improves our gut health. Now, I mentioned also that nutrition has become very controversial, but most people, I think, would agree these days that eating to improve our gut health is a good thing. Professor Tim Spector in London would agree with that. The Sonnenbergs in America, as you just mentioned, they would agree with that. Okay, so I don't think so far that's that controversial. What you just said, that it isn't necessarily the fiber, but more the fermented foods that we should be focusing on. Now, that's very interesting because there's a bit of nuance there. So when you say fermented foods... What specific types of foods are you talking about? I think you mentioned yogurt and kimchi. Are there any others that we can think about bringing into our own diets? Well, I think one of the most interesting things, um, and I've, I've talked about this uh, in past books, including the current one, is, um, is vinegars. And vinegars, um, it turns out uh, I, that we do have, hopefully, uh, what are called butyrate producing bacteria. And there are certain bacteria that can take these uh, starches and make this short chain fatty acid butyrate out, out of them. But what's fascinating, particularly in researching my new book, is uh, we, certain bacteria need the products of another bacteria to do their job. And in fact, it's, it's so intertwined that there may be uh, basically an assembly line of bacteria and the, the poop of one bacteria is the food that a second bacteria needs to eat to produce a poop that the third bacteria needs to eat and so on down the line until we get to the bacteria that can make butyrate out of all these other things, almost like a car assembly line. If the first guy falls down on his job, the guy ready to make butyrate doesn't have the things to work with. What's fascinating is, and I think this goes back to what the, the Sonnenbergs found, is a great number of butyrate-producing bacteria actually have to have 
another short chain fatty acid, acetate, acetic acid, vinegar, to actually make butyrate. And unless they have acetic acid, they can't manufacture butyrate no matter how much fiber you give them to work with. And I think that, to me, is really, again, interesting. Why why is it that cultures fermented things? I'll give you another wonderful example that I think is a fascinating paper. It was published in February of this year, and it came out of the uh, out of the Netherlands. And you're probably aware of it. Where and it got a big splash that you take a take a bunch of people with stable angina. Now, stable angina is stable, and the people have blockages in their coronary arteries. And it's enough that if uh, you're exercising fairly vigorously, you get chest pain or chest heaviness, angina. And if you stop, the chest heaviness goes away and you go about your business until you go too fast and the angina comes back. And it's actually a stable disease. That's what it means. It's stable. It really doesn't change. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to compare dairy usage in these people with stable angina and see if dairy impacted their stable angina. Did it become unstable? Did they develop a heart attack? And they had a beautiful little graph. And the paper said, gee, the more butter people eat, the more their stable angina becomes unstable, the higher the risk of a heart attack. And everybody nods their head and said, yeah, okay, butter, saturated fat, butter's bad for you. Okay, get it. Then the more dairy that people consumed, um, same sort of thing. Not as dramatic as butter, but more dairy, more chance of the un- the stable angina becoming unstable. Interesting. That That's what got the news. Dairy's bad for you. Now, down in the bottom of the paper, there was a kind of an aside that said, you know, the funny thing is, the more cheese people ate, the less unstable angina they got. In other words, their angina actually got better. And it was statistically significant. And there's a beautiful graph that anyone can pull up on the paper. And you can just see it. The more cheese you eat, the better your angina gets. And you go, what the heck? You know, butter is really bad for you. Dairy's right behind it. But cheese? Well, it turns out the cheese is a fermented food, true cheese, not our processed cheese. And there are tons of important compounds in cheese uh, that actually explains a lot of longevity in people who eat a lot of interesting cheeses that I allude to in Unlocking the Keto Code. So there's another interesting example that goes against conventional wisdom. And yet it's, I mean, it's rather blatant when you look at really the studies of the impact of fermented milk products on health. Yeah, And it's not necessarily the milk product, but it's actually the fermentation process and the products of fermentation that are actually what makes things happen. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. 